Right, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'd first like to start by <clears throat> thanking the organisers for inviting me to speak, and in particular, Alex. Um, in the email I received, um, I was asked to talk about how we apply iron mobility in our research at Amgen, and they were quite specific in that they asked for multiple examples of what we do. Um, so what I've tried to do is um, add in at least four examples of how we use iron mobility, and the fact that I now have a little bit of extra time is quite beneficial because I was going to try and squeeze in four subjects into around about 30 minutes, but now I've got 40 minutes, so thank you again for that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, deriving accurate um, nitrogen collision cross-sections on the travelling wave instrument. Then I'm going to talk briefly about analysing small molecules in different gases ranging in different polarizabilities. Then I'm going to talk about some corona discharge and how we apply that to intact proteins and native protein, um, native protein uh, complexes and then coupling this nanopore opt optical interferometry to mass spectrometry and iron mobility. So all of these subjects I'm going to talk about have either been published or are just about to be published in the scientific literature and they are all being used in Amgen today. <coughs> so uh, being first up, I've got the honour of uh, telling you all about what iron mobility is and the basics of it. Well this this depicts a drift tube. I'm not going to talk about, well, I'm not going to show a movie about the T wave because I think everybody knows what that is. Plus, um, I had a very bad experience at ASMS a few years ago and the movie didn't work, so I'm not going to risk showing it again. So basically, with iron mobility, you have a, a drift tube. It varies in length from a few centimeters up to a few meters. It's filled with a neutral gas. Typically, a lot of the traditional work has been performed in helium, but more researchers, are, more researchers now are using gases like <coughs> nitrogen, moving on to carbon dioxide, etc. You have an iron cloud here, a gate, and a, a driving drift field ranging from 60 to 200 volts. Typical pressures, 2 to 3 millitor in nitrogen, and the driving field is obviously in this direction, pulling the ions into the MS system. So the iron cloud is gated in, uh, this is on a microsecond time scale, it passes through the drift cell in a millisecond time frame, interacting with the neutral gas and being detected by the mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry. and in our case it's a time of flight. And the time it takes the ions to pass through here are governed by the short range interactions, the long range charge induced dipole interactions, the strength of the electric field, etc. So, the first paper that I'm going to talk about is something we published in <coughs> analytical chemistry around about uh, just over a year ago. And the whole premise of this was to develop a, a calibration routine in nitrogen for small molecules. Now, when the uh, T wave was originally released in, in 2006, there was a a very big push for um, structural biology and deriving collision cross-sections of large protein complexes. Uh, one, of the, one of the main drivers of that was uh, Carl Robinson and Brandon, who I've just seen walking in. And then uh, Matt Bush also pushed that forward and between them they generated a calibration routine and then later in 2010 I believe they generated a calibration cross-section database for intact proteins. Now what was clearly lacking in the field at that time I felt was the same collision cross-section database for small molecules. So I contacted Carol and Matt and we proceeded to create a calibration database for small molecules, um, essentially pharmaceutically relevant small molecules. Um, in addition to this, we also were able to tune an existing 
nitrogen trajectory method based algorithm. So the original trajectory method algorithm was based on helium, the interaction of an ion with helium, but there was also, as I'll talk about later, an existing nitrogen based algorithm which we wanted to tune. So this married quite well with the small molecule database that we were deriving and also tuning of an existing nitrogen trajectory method. Um, so the instruments that we used were this um, linear field RF confining instrument which was based in Oxford at the time. So it's a standard QTOF1 with the traveling wave cell replaced with a linear field RF confining cell. And this allows one to perform traditional drift cell line mobility experiments by ramping up the, essentially the electrostatic field from this point to that point. So you can perform your standard set of experiments which allow you to derive the cross-section of any particular ion of interest by plotting the reciprocal of the drift voltage against the drift time. And so this allowed us to perform uh, cross-section calculations from essentially first principles on the instrument in any gas we chose and in this case it was helium and nitrogen. And then as um, proof of principle of whether the compounds we measured to derive a calibration worked. We analyzed those and used those to calibrate unknowns on the Synap G2. And everyone in this audience, I think, knows how the traveling wave works. You have RF confinement, and on top of that, you have superimposed DC voltage traveling in the axial direction in the order of 300 to maybe 1,000 meters per second depending on the experiment you're performing. And the amplitude of these is usually anywhere from 20 to 40 volts. And on the G2, the amplitude is applied to pairs of plates. Now, <clears throat> the compounds that we chose to analyze to derive a small molecule calibration routine range from the small ethyl aniline up to reserpine. So we measured these at 10 different voltages we plotted a linear reciprocal over drift time and from this, from the slope, we're able to calculate the mobility and therefore the collision cross-section of each of these pharmaceutically relevant molecules in helium and in nitrogen. So what we came up with was this calibration database here. So for n ethyl aniline, the collision cross-section is 124 and all the way up to reserpine, which was uh, 254. So you'll note we've also got hydrogen, sorry, helium and nitrogen collision cross-sections. Now at the same time, I was um, interested to see whether we could, <coughs> resolve is the wrong word, but to see whether we can differentiate beta-methasone and dexamethasone on the G2 instrument. So you'll notice they only differ in one chiral center. So it's this methyl either in the S or the R configuration. So we also measured these by standard drift tube in nitrogen. So the collision cross sections we obtained are uh, this value here, 189, 190, differing by one angstrom squared. So we wanted to see using this nitrogen collision cross section database whether we could obtain the same collision cross-sections for these two steroids on the T-wave. Well, the first thing to note is we were able to differentiate these two molecules on the T-wave. They have a very subtle arrival time distribution. And if we use this calibration routine, we can derive these collision cross-sections here, differing by one angstrom squared. And they are very consistent with the drift tube derived collision cross-section. So I think that in itself is very good proof of principle that the collision cross-section database that we've derived on a standard drift tube can be applied to small molecules on a G2. And we can also show that the resolution on the G2 is sufficient to differentiate these two diastereoisomers, but obviously not separate them because that would be very challenging on any system. 
Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, there was an existing algorithm, a trajectory method-based algorithm, which allows for the theoretical calculation of nitrogen collision cross-sections. Um, since the G2, uh, the synapse instruments, predominantly use nitrogen to perform their iron mobility separations, it did seem rather prudent that that algorithm be used and be tuned for G2 temperatures and pressures. Now, this algorithm, it was tuned <coughs> for atmospheric pressures and temperatures, so that wasn't really appropriate for the G2, since it works at much lower pressures and lower temperatures. So we went about tuning that, and we ran a number of compounds. These are just a selection here. A set of polyaromatic hydrocarbons that allowed us to tune the carbon hydrogen interaction, sorry, the, the, the hydrogen-helium interaction, and C70 and C60, which allowed us to tune the uh, carbon and helium interaction. So, essentially, what we did, we scaled these two values here in the, uh, in the, potential, in the potential description of the algorithm. So, this first, this first, Part of the equation describes the uh, short range Van der Waals Leonard Jones potential. This last um, portion of the equation here describes the long range dipole interaction. It contains the polarizability of the gas of interest. So, essentially, what we did, we just scaled these two values here, which derive the, uh, the energy of the minimum of the potential well and the distance here. This has all been described by Alex and Martin Gerald about 16, 17 years ago in the original helium trajectory-based algorithm. So rather than go through all of these, I'm just going to show you a plot here where we derive the collision cross-section in nitrogen of a number of different tuning compounds, ranging from C70 all the way down to uh, naphthalene and some uh, smaller quaternary ammonium ions. And we plotted that against the nitrogen trajectory method-based algorithm. And you can see here we've got very good linear correlation with an R squared of 0.99. So in a nutshell, <coughs> we retuned the nitrogen-based trajectory method such that it worked very well at T-wave operating pressures and temperatures. So if we then look at a brief summary on this beta methazone and dexamethazone here, we can see that the traveling wave derived collision cross-section using our calibration routine of small molecules gave us 189.4, the RF drift tube in nitrogen 198.6, and the trajectory-based me method at 189.4. So... I think that's very good agreement between all three modes of deriving collision cross-sections, two being instrumental and the final one being theoretically derived. So not only is there now a helium-based trajectory method, there also is a nitrogen-based trajectory method which allows for theoretical collision cross-sections of small molecules. And one thing I should note as well, we've actually used this collision cross-section uh, nitrogen-based method to derive cross-sections on peptide radicals, and they also correlate the theoretical cross-sections very well with instrument-derived. So this takes me on to the uh, final slide of this part of the presentation, <coughs> where I've superimposed here the electrostatic surface potential of beta-methazone and dexamethazone. And the reason behind this is we didn't just want to show we got two diastereoisomers. We can show a difference in arrival time distribution. We wanted to go a little bit further. We wanted to try and understand why there is that difference. So the point being is we wanted to try and understand based on a short-range interaction or the long-range charge-induced dipole interaction of the ion mobility separation, which one is dominant. <clears throat> so to analyze the uh, long-range charge-induced dipole effects, we, we plotted the surface charge distribution by quantum mechanics. 
Now we can see here, the blue represents the positive charge, so this is the lowest energy structure here with the protonation on this, on this region here. So the overall electrostatic surface potential is the same. So from that we can say that the long range charge induced attractive forces between these ions and nitrogen are very, very similar, if not identical. So the basis of this separation here must be because of the orientation of this S and R configuration. So the separation we see here is due to the short range interactions between the drift gas and this region here. Um, at the same time we also ran beta dexamethasone in helium and again we noted a very subtle a very subtle change in the drift time. Now that drift time difference was very similar to that in nitrogen. Just take note that this is a G2, this is a G1 linear field drift tube instrument. So <clears throat> this tied in very well with some data that was acquired uh, with some collaborators in Brazil a number of years prior to this, where we analyzed some compounds in different drift gases all ranging in different polarizabilities here so ranging from helium all the way up to ethene and the polarizabilities of these gases are significantly different so this is something which was just recently submitted to journal of mass spectrometry and we wanted to compare or at least note the differences in T wave separation compared to the differences in the drift gas polarizability. So if we take these first two compounds here, and again, we've plotted the surface charge distribution using quantum mechanics and uh, displayed that as an electrostatic surface potential here. So you've got N-butyl uh, N aniline and parabutyl aniline. So the charge resides on the nitrogen here. So you can see on this one, in the, uh, the butyl in the para position, the charge is located on the NH2 group. It's very concentrated up here. And in this one, the N-butyl, the charge is more dispersed. And you've also got inductive effects from the alkyl chain here. So if we perform separation in helium, we get zero separation here. This is a mixture on a G1 T wave instrument. If we then perform the separation in nitrogen, we begin to see almost baseline resolution between these two compounds. And in the more polar drift gases, we see baseline resolution. If we move to these two negatively charged lipids, so we've got cis and trans oleic acid. We see a little separation in nitrogen. We see partial separation in carbon dioxide. If we move to these halogenated anilines, which are very similar to the ones Herbert Hill looked at uh, over 10 years ago, we can see partial separation in helium and as the drift gas polarizability increases to CO2, we get almost baseline separation. And this is a very interesting set of compounds here, these imidazole ions here. You've got a single imidazole ring here and two imidazole rings and you can see this one doubly charged has a huge amount of positive charge distributed over the entire molecule. In helium, we see good separation here. In nitrogen, no separation. Then in the very polar nitrous oxide, we see an inversion of the two. So this black dot here represents 4A, a singly charged. The star represents a doubly charged. And in the more polar drift gas, these two are inverted. Now that's actually quite interesting and I think that can be explained as a function of the charge and its interaction with the more polar drift gas. So this highly charged iron, when it drifts through the more polar drift gas, it is more retarded than that in the less polar drift gas. So that's why you see, or at least we think you see the inversion. 
And it's quite also tempting to make the relationship between the quantum mechanically derived dipole moment of all of these compounds and relate that to the separation you see in the drift cell and correlate that to the uh, you correlate that to the polarizability of the drift gas because what you in fact what you actually see uh, is as the polarizability of the drift gas increases you see more separation of species which differ more significantly with the quantum mechanically calculated dipole moment. So that, that is quite interesting in itself. Okay, so summarizing points of the first third of the talk are T wave differentiation of two diastereoisomers, so these just differ in one chiral center, accurate collision cross sections based in nitrogen. We've optimized a nitrogen based trajectory method calculation. Um, we've also related charge distribution to the observed traveling wave separation. Trying to understand the charge distribution may help understand ion mobility behavior in the traveling wave. And like I said, we use this at Amgen because improved separation of um, pharmacologically relevant compounds using different drift gases. And in fact, we've got a poster um, at ASMS this year where we use different drift gases to look at different conformations of certain peptides. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, so the second part of the talk, um, I've still got close to 20 minutes left, is um, we coupled electrospray corona discharge, charge reduction, and iron mobility in the hope that we could charge reduce peptides and large macromolecular complexes. Um, and this has just recently appeared in a, a T-Wave special um, edition for our International Journal of Iron Mobility and Mass Spectrometry, where um, Kevin Giles from Waters was the guest editor. And we were lucky enough to be able to submit something to this journal. So, what are the alternative strategies for charge stripping? Well, there's a number of them, ranging from uh, radioactive alpha sources, uh, polonium-210, for instance, in the source of the instrument. You've got iron-iron chemistries, and you've got um, corona discharge, which was pioneered by Lloyd Smith around about 10 years ago, which is what we developed for our instrumentation based on his models. So. Lloyd Smith in analytical chemistry in 2000 developed this source here which uh, essentially has a high voltage platinum wire here based on a point to plane discharge so you have a high voltage applied to this platinum wire and around about two or three millimeters away from that fine tip there is a grounding plate and between the high voltage and the grounding plate you generate a corona discharge and in Lloyd Smith's design this was enclosed in a small Faraday cage whereas in ours you'll see it wasn't and arguably <coughs> for small proteins our data our source doesn't charge reduce as efficiently as theirs but nevertheless we still do um, we still do produce very very nice data so what they do they uh, infuse a protein solution through electrospray the positively charged ions interact with a mixture of negatively charged ions because you're ionizing by corona discharge whatever gas is in this Faraday cage, so nitrogen, oxygen. In the case of Lloyd Smith design, they used medical grade oxygen. And you can see here a range of charge reduced small proteins ranging from singly charged myoglobin at just under 17,000 all the way down to melatonin and insulin. Our design is based on this here, this discharge pin. Again, we've got a platinum wire and a point to plane, so we've got a grounded uh, discharge plate, platinum wire, and the distance between these two is around about two or three millimeters. Um, the mechanism is not addition of an electron. It is charge stripping in terms of proton abstraction because if you see this singly charged glue fib, the mass of calculated singly charged glue fib is 1570 and that is what we see. We do not see 
the major 1571, which would correspond to GFP plus 2 plus an electron, which is analogous to ETD. So we do not see that. So we know that the mechanism is consistent with proton abstraction, because that is what the mass tells us and also the isotope distribution tells us. Um, they say picture paints uh, a thousand words. So this is the corona discharge probe here. This is the uh, sampling cone of the instrument. So we've got the electric spray probe coming down at the top here in, uh, in this direction, perpendicular to the discharge plate here. We've got two grounding, grounding cables which are attached to the discharge plate here. And the platinum wire comes in here. The tip is about there. And you can see this large glow discharge because we're applying around about minus five, six thousand volts, which equates on this system to about 400 microamps. And again, we've got this looking down in the vertical direction. We're using corona discharge with a nanoflow needle here. So this for the more routine samples, peptides, uh, relatively easy proteins. This nanoflow introduction for the uh, large protein complexes. And this shows a profile of glue fib here and ubiquitin. So if we see a zero volt, zero current, we have a doubly charged glue fib and we have the charge distribution distributed down to the low M over Z region for ubiquitin. Then if we ramp up the discharge voltage, we can see that the dominant peak for glue fib is singly charged and then we can see the distribution of the plus one, two, three, four, and five charge states for ubiquitin, which were absent in the spectra where there was no corona discharge voltage. So very effective charge reduction. And it actually looks like here you get your most efficient production of singly charged around about 7,000 volts. Well, in fact, if you look at this graph here, which shows the distribution of all the charge states for ubiquitin, you're actually getting the most intense singly charged peak at around about three and a half, four thousand volts. So the higher you go, you're actually removing charge from all of these species. So therefore, you're removing the actual signal intensity. Um, PEG, polyethylene glycol, is widely used in the pharmaceutical business. And we find corona discharge and charge reduction very useful in the analysis of PEG because in the absence of corona discharge, you just get a, um, an overlapping distribution of charges in the low M over Z region, which can be challenging to deconvolute. But with corona discharge on, you get a nice distribution of intense singly, doubly, and triply, which makes life a lot easier to interpret and deconvolute. And, and why is this beneficial to charge reduce uh, native proteins. Now, back in 2005, a very, I am biased, but I will say that this is a very beautiful set of experiments performed by Brandon. Um, and essentially they proved that with this particular protein, the lowest charge state is the most native. So it makes sense to try and drive your protein conformations to the lowest charge state possible. So we thought we'd try that with our corona discharge probe working with the uh, nanoflow, nanoflow needle to introduce the sample. So we can see here that we've got a range of proteins ranging from alcohol dehydrogenase at 147 kilodaltons, it's a homotetramer, all the way up to GROEL, which is a, a 14-mer. And we can see that in the absence of corona discharge, these lower spectra here, we see the typical charge state distribution very narrow uh, with ADH is based around plus 25 and grow EL plus 68. And then if we uh, turn on corona discharge, so in the order of about 5,000 volts, we can see that the charge state distribution is shifted all the way up to the high M over Z regions, equating to about plus 10 charges here. And again, grow EL is shifted all the way up here. It's interesting to note that the larger the protein becomes, the less efficient the charge reduction actually is. So we're not sure whether that's <clears throat> an effect of the instrument, the transmission of these large ions, or whether it's the inefficiency of our source to charge reduce at very large complexes. But that is under further investigation. 
Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go over this quite quickly. Uh, we then combine this with iron mobility to see if we could derive any collision cross-sections for these low molecular weight species. So the protein of interest here is pyruvate kinase. We chose this because it fits well between the existing protein calibration standards, which were ADH, GDH, and uh, I can't remember the other one. But suffice to say, this fell quite well within the calibration range of some native protein complexes. So we charge reduced pyruvate kinase. We're able to obtain charge states all the way from plus 35 to plus 24. And we derive the collision cross sections of these. So as you can see, as the charge state reduces, so does the collision cross section. And these are helium based numbers. If we also compare like for like charge state, because one of the interesting things were, or was, is does the charge state change in collision cross section value? If you compare, let's say, the plus 30, I can't even read this, the plus 33, yeah, the plus 33 of the non charge reduced and the 33 of the charge reduced. And you can see here that the collision cross sections are pretty much identical between corona discharge on and off, which is encouraging. <clears throat> okay, so what have I told you here? So, summarizing points, we've manufactured an effective corona discharge source, operates by the generation of localized corona discharge using point-to-plane mechanism. It effectively charge reduces biological samples ranging from small peptides to large multimeric complexes. And we've shown that the combination of corona discharge with traveling wave and we can derive collision cross sections for charge reduced pyruvate kinase. Okay, in the final eight or so minutes, I'm going to talk about coupling biosensor technologies to liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. So what are biosensors? Well, essentially they allow you to immobilize a protein enzyme of interest to a surface, <coughs> then flow over a small molecule or group of small molecules, peptides, proteins, whatever, and you can then measure the binding constants. So you can measure the on rates, the off rates, and the, and the KDs. So that's very important in biopharmaceuticals because you want to understand how well or how poor a small molecule binds to a target of interest. So what we've chosen is this nanopore optical interferometry. So you essentially have a, a pore. And I'll talk about the dimensions of that in a minute. Um, but essentially, optical interferometry measures precisely the changes in refractive index in this pore in the presence and absence of the binding of a small molecule. And it's this optical path difference, which is then deconvoluted, and a KD on and an off rate is derived. Um, so we obtained this technology from a company called Silicon Kinetics based in San Diego and they create these chips by electrochemically etching porous silicon. The silicon is housed inside this chip so this chip is about one centimeter by one centimeter dimensions. You've got two little ports here and inside you've got identical electrochemically etched silicon surfaces. They're about 80% porous and each pore has a radius of around about 40, uh, 40 nanometers. And the average pore size is around about 1.5 micron deep. Um, the surfaces are then treated with var various chemistries which allow you to couple enzymes to them. So for instance we use um, carboxy surfaces which allow you to use carboxyl chemistry to then couple an enzyme by amine coupling. So you're covalently coupling an enzyme to this surface by amine coupling. Um, you can also have streptavidin surfaces as well. So if your protein has biotin bound to it, you flow it over a streptavidin surface and it binds very tightly. So and in the case of these surfaces here, we can bind around about 100 times more on this surface than we can a planar, bi a planar surface 
which is essentially what you would see in surface plasma resonance. So the fact that we can bind 100 times more protein allows us to bring the sensitivity up in, term, in terms of mass spectrometry sensitivity because the amount of small molecule you're flowing over a surface plasma resonance surface and eluting off is too low to detect by mass spectrometry reliably. So the fact that we've now got 100 times more binding to this surface, this brings this level of sensitivity up and combines quite well with mass spectrometry. So the type of kinetics you obtain once you've immobilized an enzyme so for instance here I said before we're using a carboxyl surface which has been activated by EDC and this NHS and that covalently couples amine couples the protein to the surfaces and then you wash over a small molecule and then you elute the small molecule from the protein so what you can see here is the small molecule binding to the protein so this is the on rate and the protein washing on, uh, the small molecule washing onto the protein. Then the off rate is measured. The small molecule elutes off the protein. And then you can derive a KD. So this 766 nanomolar is for this compound here, furosemide. It's an inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase. The surface plasma resonance derived KD is around about 500 nanomolar with a silicon kinetics instrument we can derive a KD very similar in the order of 700 nanomolar. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this particularly long, but essentially we've run a number of different carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and the SPR KDs and on-off rates are very similar to that of the silicon kinetics. Um, <clears throat> this is the technology here. You have the silicon kinetics sensor box so inside here you've got all the fluidics, the chip is mounted, you've got the auto sampler, so you've got a 96 well plate in here with a library of compounds for instance. You have your chip surface, one thing I should have mentioned, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides, is this here you've got in one of the ports you've got protein immobilized and in the other port you have no protein immobilized. So you've got a reference port. Whoops. So you've got the auto sampler, you've got the sensor chip, you've got this switching valve, you've got a HPLC and you've got a mass spectrometer. So everything that elutes out of the sensor chip is captured in some sampling loops in this fluidics and then is diverted to LC and the mass spectrometer. Um, this are, these are the fluidics here. So suffice it to say you have a sample loop and a reference loop and everything that comes off from the sample channel and the reference channel is captured in these loops and then diverted to the mass spectrometer. So you can analyze essentially what has come off during the off rate period of the kinetics reaction. And you can sample at a number of different times here. So this is the reference. Obviously the response to the reference is not as high as that for the sample. And de depending on where you sample and what the off rate is, you can get an idea of what small molecules elute off from that incubation, depending on whether you analyze a single compound or a whole library of compounds. And analyzing a library significantly increases your throughput for screening. I think I'll skip over that. So um, we can also couple that to iron mobility. So not only can we couple the optical interferometry to LC, we can couple it to iron mobility. So we've got these sulfonilamide isomers, so the uh, amine group in the 2, 3 and the 4 position. We can derive kinetics information for all of these. The KDs only vary by an order of magnitude. We can obtain LC information, but because it's being run on an iron mobility instrument, in parallel we can obtain iron mobility instruments, so we can derive collision cross-sections for all of these in parallel with LC separation and kinetics. Um, and again, a mixture of compounds. You've got furosemide, and also we have sulfonilamide, small molecule isomers here. So we can 
analyze a mixture of compounds by LC ion mobility. And we're not quite sure how we're going to use this yet because there's obviously a lot of information which needs to be deconvoluted. Okay, in the very end, summarizing points, we've coupled nanopore optical interferometry to LCMS. We have fully automated the LCMS using contact closure triggers. We've optimized the LCMS sample referencing times so we can sample the off rate at the correct time and see what's eluting off. And this method has been uh, reduced to a five minute turnaround time. It obviously needs a little bit more work and the future work and optimization is based on automated sample identification using the open link software and possible integration of iron mobility into the workflow. Um, and thank you for listening. I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Very, very interesting and very fundamental research for a pharmaceutical company, I would say, um, kind of very academic even in some aspects. Oh, yeah, that's uh, cool. What are the <coughs> questions? Yes. Well, they, they are similar compound classes. They all are small molecule based. They're not peptide or lipid based or amino acid based. So if you're referring to different classes which may lie on different mobility trends, they are the same class of compounds. I mean, they are all small pharmaceutically derived, you know, culture scene, for instance. No, they weren't, no. It was just a group of pharmaceutically relevant compounds. Okay, uh, other questions? So, um, when you show some of your targeted relationship or organ proteins, It was, yes, it's radiates. Well so remembered. Given the fact that the rest of those look like they represent some sort of trailing kind of shift of some kind, how does one interpret that by both? I mean, there's a very easy answer for this one. Um, it just happened to be the spectra that we chose. On one particular day, it would show that bimodal distribution. On another particular acquisition with a certain flow rate needle tip it would show a distribution similar to this so there is some small variability in the spectra that you do observe what that's down to probably the, the spray process the, the actual flow rate whether it's 100 nanoliters per minute to 300 I think it all depends on the size of the orifice, to be honest. Or maybe even the, the you know, micro changes in the position of the tip in relation to the, the discharge plate or the actual flow rate of the gas. But one thing I didn't mention in the talk is that you can quite subtly change the level of charge reduction by one, the voltage. I think you got an idea of that from one of the plots but you can also change it by the flow rate of the gas through the actual discharge tip. So, All right. Let's thank the speaker and move on.